All right, week 23 on the chronological this time. Uh, and hopefully we can make this one a little less intense than last week. Um, and it was, it was a lot of uh, interesting fun with the topic last week in Bolivar. Uh, it, it, went, it went a lot milder at Memphis, although it was just guys, so, you know, had a little bit more freedom from a guy's standpoint, but it was a little more challenging at Bolivar just because you had the, the mixture, male and female, in there, and, um, it, well, it, it, got, it got fun. Um, <laughs> so, we can edit that part out. So, all right, week 23 of the Chronological. Uh, I'm going to be uh, at 1 Kings chapter uh, 8 and 9 this week. Uh, in this section this week, you've got, uh, you've got what we'll look at today in also 2 Chronicles passage. They're almost identical. Uh, and then you've got some Proverbs and so a few Psalms in there. I'm going to just use the 1 Kings passage, uh, chapter 8 and 9, really. Um, Back up to just kind of say what's going on before this. Solomon's, of course, king. Uh, he's in the process of building the temple. And so in the process of building this temple, those chapters before chapter 8, he's going into a lot of detail. And if you went and read the, the Second Chronicles passage, it's almost word for word in a lot of the places. So there's a, just a lot of detail. And he's not just building the temple. Uh, he's also in the process of building his own palace. Okay, it is going on at the same time period. But it gives us a whole lot of information on you know, all the cedar uh, timbers and all these different things that are going on. The massive amount of gold and bronze. And, I mean, it's, I mean it, it had to have been a sight to see when they were done with this thing. And the wealth that had been value had been poured into this thing were pretty substantial. Once it gets finished, chapter 8 kicks in, and this is where they're going to dedicate the temple. Now, this temple, known as Solomon's Temple, but it's really David planned everything, had most all the materials dealt with, the gold, the silver, the bronze, all that stuff. He had a lot of the skilled workmen already lined up. So while it's Solomon's Temple, it was David's plan that God had given him. So Solomon finishes this up, and... In this process, they're not going to dedicate the temple, and then Solomon's going to, it's a prayer, but it's really a little worship service that he's, as king's, going to lead in this. That's really what I want to look at right now. Chapter 8, verse 1, and I'm going to skip through this. I've just got some areas underlined we'll read. <coughs> Chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel all the tribal heads and the ancestral leaders of the Israelites before him at Jerusalem in order to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from the city of David, that is Zion. Okay. Unlike Daddy the first time when they got ready to move the ark, he's going to be well much more prepared to do it the correct way this time. So he gathers everybody together. Then look over at verse 3. All the elders of Israel came and the priests picked up the ark. They didn't put it on a cart this time. They picked up the ark. The priests and the Levites brought the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and the holy utensils that were in the tent. So this time they come prepared, and they move the stuff the correct way. And then look at verse 6. The priests brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place beneath the wings of the cherub. So they bring it in, and they put it in the right spot. Okay? The priest, okay? Solomon, he's not touching it, nobody else. They're coming the correct way, and they're putting it into the, the holy place, the most holy place. Okay? They get it into that, and then skip down to verse 10. When the priest came out of the holy place, they've gone in, they put it in, they walk out. The cloud filled the Lord's temple, and because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. They put the ark in there, which is where this was symbolic. This is where God was going to be, right? And so they put the ark in, and the moment that they walk out, 
They can't go back again. Why? Because God's come. Okay, what's he doing? God's really anointing this whole endeavor. He's coming and his presence is there. Now, no longer can people just any time they want walk into the most holy of holies. They can't just walk in there. Now, all of a sudden, it's stopped. Verse 12, Then Solomon said, The Lord said that he would dwell in total darkness. I have indeed built, built an exalted temple for you, a place for your dwelling forever. Okay? God is accepting the this whole thing by the fact that he came and he dwelled in it and they see this. They see it happen. They see the cloud come over and the Spirit of God is there. Then look down at verse 20. The Lord has fulfilled what he promised. I have taken the place of my father David and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. I have built a temple for the name of of the Lord, the God of Israel, I have provided a place there for the ark, where the Lord's covenant is that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, ark's there, temple's done, God showed up, okay, and basically he's saying what? We've completed the task, and how long has God had this plan going on? As far as they know, from what? Back to when they came out of Egypt, which by this point would be... Four, 450 years? 400 years? Something like that? Okay. So God's had this plan. Okay, Moses had built the specs to start with, but now they've got what? The temple in where God wanted it, in Jerusalem. And it's the ark's there, and God has anointed it. It's a completed job when his presence comes in. Now, chapter or same chapter, verse 22. Here the king is fixing to lead and worship to their God, to Yahweh. Okay? Look at this, verse 22. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire congregation of Israel and spread out his hands toward the heavens. He said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or earth below. This is a prayer, but it's also what? This is worship. Okay? Now notice in his prayer, what's the first thing he's doing? He's praising who? The God of all creation. Okay? He's acknowledging who? That he's God of all of it. Okay? That's an act of worship when you are acknowledging the traits of God. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Okay? Above all heaven and earth. But then he says, Who keeps the gracious covenant with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts? You have kept what you promised to your servant, my father David. You spoke, spoke directly to him. And you fulfilled your promise by your power as it is today. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, keep what you promised to your servant, my father David. You will never fail to have a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons take care to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now David wasn't perfect, okay? but God knew his heart. Okay. Now, what's this next thing he's doing? He's giving praise and honor to a promise-keeping God. And again, you can actually go back beyond just daddy, right? For King David, you can go on back. You can go on back to the time of Moses. You can go on back from Moses back to Jacob when he said the scepter won't leave the tribe of Judah. Here Solomon is, is what? In that direct line. Okay? You can go on past that. You can go back to Isaac. You can go back before that. You can go to Abraham, right? Okay? When he promises Abraham, you're not only going to have a descendant, you're going to have descendants, and I'm going to build them into a nation. Okay? So what's he doing? He's, he's also praising and giving honor to a promise-keeping, promise-honoring, covenant-keeping God. Okay? And then the next section, look at 26. Now, Lord God of Israel, please confirm what you promised to your servant, my father David. And then verse 27. But will God indeed live on earth? Even heaven, the highest heavens, cannot contain you. Much less, much less this temple that I built. God, you, are you really going to come live here? 
in this temple, in this place, and as spectacular as it was, would it compare to what heaven and what the real temple looks like? Not a chance. Okay? Are you really going to come here and live? Even And then he's going to say, but even the heavens, the highest heavens can't contain you. Why? God's everywhere. Okay? They can't contain. What's he really talking about? He's talking about the omnipresence of God. God's everywhere. Can you go anywhere? He ain't there. No. But then he's still sitting there scratching his head, I think, in his prayer, and he's going, are you really going to come live here? Okay. Right here. Verse 28. Listen to your servant's prayer and his petition. Lord my God, so that you may hear the cry and the prayer of your servant, that your servants, sure, that your servant prays before you today, so that your eyes may watch over this temple day and night toward the place where you said, My name will be there, and so that you may hear the prayer of your servant, that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the petition of your servant and your people, Israel, which they pray, pray toward this place. May you hear in your dwelling place in heaven. May you hear and forgive. Here's where God's now pointed them. They've got the place that they are praying. And you get down farther in time. You get to the time where Daniel is now off in, in exile in Babylon. And where does he do? When he goes to pray, he prays what? Pointed back toward Jerusalem. Okay? When they pray, and so he's praying here, but hey. We're going to pray back to this direction, but guess what? We need you to hear us from there. Okay? So he's seeing a difference between just the spot and where God really is. Okay? So in this case, he's petition, petitioning God for mercy for Israel. Okay? When their sin is going to be in many different ways comes, comes into play. Because look at the end of it. He says, may you hear and forgive. Okay? Look, anybody without sin? Anybody without sin today? Okay. Anytime you come and gonna go before the Lord, you need to have what? Clean hands. Okay. So may you hear and forgive. And then verse 31, he starts off on some different sections. He's really gonna go back. You remember in Deuteronomy 28, we talked about the blessings and the curses? God says, here's the blessings if you follow me, but here's the curses if you don't. Remember those things? Go back later on and just take a quick look. And when you see Solomon's prayer, he's coming off of that same thought process. Okay? Except he knows they're going to do it. Why? Well, Israel's got a pretty good track record at this point. There's 400 years of track record. Okay? So it starts out with <coughs> chapter 8, verse 31. When a man sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath, and he comes to take an oath before your altar in this temple. What's he talking about? Well, like we talked about one the other here recently about if a woman, if a husband thought her woman was cheating on her, he'd take her up there, and they would, there would be that oath that would be done that God would judge. Well, that's kind of the same thing. If, if there's a problem and you come before the Lord in the, at the temple and you're, you're trying to settle the dispute and somebody's taking an oath, that's kind of the context that's going on before the altar. May you hear in heaven and act. Give a righteous judgment, right? The judge of the earth. May you judge your servants, condemning the wicked man by bringing what he has done on his own head and providing justice for the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. If this guy's done, if, if one guy has wronged the other one, okay, and they come to this temple to settle this thing, okay? Which means we're coming to God to be what? Judge, okay? Which he knows everything, right? So Solomon's looking into the future and knows people are going to be coming here even to settle disputes and stuff. And if you've got somebody who sinned against another person and they come here for that, may you judge righteously, okay? And justly. Okay? Because that really is the trait of God, isn't it? Righteous, just, 
Okay. And then verse 33. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy. We're starting to hear that blessings and curses side come up. When they're defeated before an enemy. Has this happened to them at this point? Through that whole time of the judges. Every time they'd sin, God used what? All those enemies around them to what? Put them right under their thumb. And basically God was disciplining them for doing what they'd done. For rebelling against him. So they've had a history of that. So he's looking forward. And they're, they're in a time of peace. Because under David, everything got what? Taken care of. All their enemies. And then Solomon's living in the privilege of all that. And he's amassing and building a greater army. Okay, so they're at rest with all their enemies at this moment. But I think the fact that he's the wisest man on the planet didn't take a whole lot to look and go, we're going to be back here sometime in the future. Okay? When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you. Okay? Matter of fact, I was just thinking another one. Remember what happened at, uh, when they came across the Jordan? Okay, the first place they went to was Jericho. Had a great victory there. Okay, they little bitty town AIs up there, and hey, they were like, yeah, no big deal. We'll just go dig small little force, We'll go up there. What happened? They got their butts handed to them. And what was the problem? There was sin in the camp. Okay, they've been defeated because they have sinned. And they return to you and praise your name. And they pray and plead with you for mercy. Where? In this temple. Okay. In this temple. May you hear in heaven and forgive their sin. Of your, forgive the sin of your people Israel. May you restore them to the land you gave their ancestors. When they, another place is going to come back and they've used this for. When they come to their senses. And they come back and they what? They're, when they show back up at the temple, okay, they show back up at the temple and they repent, okay, forgive them and restore them, okay. And then verse thirty-five, when the skies are shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against you, part of those blessings and curses again was if I shut up the heavens and there's been no rain, right? All those things are coming back. So what song? He's playing off the same stuff. Okay? When the skies are shut off, there's no rain because you've sinned. They've sinned against you. And they pray toward this place and praise your name. And they turn from their sins because you are afflicting them. What's he talking about? When they're rebelling against you and you were what? Basically our day taking you to the woodshed or taking you outside and whooping you. Okay? When they're being whooped, okay, and they decide what? To repent, okay? They turn from their sins because you're afflicting them. May you hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your servants and your people Israel so they may teach them the good way that they should walk in. May you send rain on their land that you gave your people for an inheritance. He's talking about who? God's people. When God's people, he, he's not talking about the other nations out there. He's not talking about the other people. He's talking about who? God's people. Who's that? Israel at this point. When they've sinned and they decide that, you know what, I'm going to repent, forgive them. Okay? And then this next one's kind of the catch all of all of it. When there is famine in the land, when there is pestilence, when there is blight, mildew, locust or grasshopper, when their enemy besieges them in the land and in the cities, when there are any Ill, uh, plague or illness, <laughs> it's kind of throwing it all together, right? When there's any of this stuff that's going on out there, okay? God, when any of this stuff, all or any of it are going on, okay, every prayer or petition that any person or that all your people Israel may have, they each know their own affliction. It's a little bit more personal. It's not just the, the group, right? It's the individuals, okay? 
And look, the nation can be having their own set of problems, okay? but it's usually made up of what? People? Okay? And so as that's going on, okay, all these little individuals, everybody, God takes each individual person to task. Okay? If they're his. Now, I've always been told, you, you, know if, you know if you're a child of God, if he ever disciplines you. If he don't ever discipline you, your mama don't, didn't ever walk around and go whoop the other kids, did they? She just got you. Okay? So, this is the children of Israel. Okay? And they're, each one knows their own affliction, their individual. As they spread out their hands toward this temple. Again, we're back toward the temple. May you hear in heaven your dwelling place. May you act, uh, forgive, act, and give everyone according to their ways, since you know each heart. For you alone know every human heart, so that they may fear you all the days they live in the land you gave our ancestors. Okay. God hears and knows all the stuff in your heart. We don't want our mama knowing what we think about, okay? but God knows all that stuff. Okay. And then, to pull away from this blessing and curses a little bit here, he says, even for the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name. People that have somewhere else have heard of the God of Israel and the blessings of Israel and have done what? Left theirs to come over here to Israel where the God of the Israelites is, okay? For they will hear of your great name, your strong hand and your outstretched arms, and will come and pray toward this temple. Hey, they're not Israelites, but they can come where? Pray at the temple. See, equality in this point is not about a race. It's not about a people group. It's about what? It's about God. It's about coming to the one true living God, which is for anybody. Okay? He's going to he's going to show themselves to the world, show God to the world. Okay, not for just Israel, but salvation is for everybody. Okay? And then he says, verse forty three: May you hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all the foreigner ask. Then all peoples of earth will know your name, to fear you as your people Israel do, and to know that this temple I have built bears your name, God. So who? They're supposed to be a lighthouse to what? The entire world. So that the entire world knows who the one true living God is. They're going to fail miserably. But that's what they're supposed to be doing. Okay? So here's Solomon dedicating the temple. And what's he bringing up? Oh, even when foreigners, outsiders, hear and want to come to pray and Really looking for salvation through what? The God of the Jews? Okay. And then, verse 44, when your people go out to fight against their enemies, wherever you send them, and they pray to the Lord in the direction of the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, may you hear their prayer and petition in heaven and uphold their cause. People go out to fight against the enemy where you send them. This is not what them having to what defend themselves. This is God. Really, you could take this and put this probably just into everyday daily life. God, when you send them out to do anything, okay, this is a punishment. This is just walking out, walking and doing what God gave you. Okay, y'all, y'all do realize there's a spiritual battle going on, right? Okay. Help in the battles. Help, help in the day-to-day -day struggles. Just God be with them. Okay. When people are what? Praying toward what? Your, your temple. Because your temple, this is where God at this moment in time was where? This was where God was. This is where you prayed toward. Because God, would, you pray here, but where was God? He wasn't there, was He? He's in heaven. He would hear from heaven those prayers. 
then 46, when they sin against you, and we're back to that, okay? For there is no one who does not sin. They will, okay? And you are angry with them. We're back to that whole blessings, blessings and curses thing. You're angry with them, and your hand, and you hand them over to the enemy, and their captors deport them to the enemy's country when they're sent into captivity. This, I think, is prophetic from his standpoint. Because God's told them, you do all these things, and you will get done exactly what I'm kicking these people out. You're going to get the same thing if you do all this idolatry and all these things. One of these days, he's saying what? When, when they get kicked out and they're in captivity, okay, that's what he's talking about here, in captivity, to the enemy's country, whether distant or nearby. Look, they, were, they had localized stuff for a long time. But you get to the end of the king's portion, and Nebuchadnezzar are going to finish out the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Okay? And they're going off into captivity outside to a distant land. And when they come to their senses, look, sometimes you got to get people way, have to get way on out there, okay, to get them to come to their senses. It's hard. It's, gonna, it's hard to watch them bouncing off the bottom a little bit. And you know, what you realize is a lot of times when they're bouncing, what you think is the bottom, they ain't quite hit it yet, okay? And in this case, they're going to bounce so hard that eventually God's going to what? Send them off into captivity for them to eventually what? Come to their senses. When they come to the sen their senses in the land where they were deported and repent and petition you in their captor's land, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked. And when they return to you with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies who took them captive, and when they pray to you in the direction of their land that you gave their ancestors, Daniel's an example of this, okay? In the city you've chosen, and the temple I built for your name, may you hear from heaven, may you hear in heaven your dwelling place. Okay. And then verse 50, here's what he says for him. May you forgive your people who sinned against you and all the rebellious, uh, all their rebellions against you. And may you grant them compassion before their captors so that they may treat them compassionately. Look, you end up in a captivity you're not guaranteed nobody's going to treat you kindly. Matter of fact, you're going in as slaves. Okay? But when they come to their senses and pray, Lord, may you give them what? Compassion, their captors, compassion over them. Okay? And look, their history has been just devastating. And again, like I said here not too long ago, there's not too many people groups that could have withstood the historical attempt to exterminate them from the very, very beginning for thousands of years, okay? But somewhere along the way, what? People have compassion for them. Where's that coming from? I think Solomon prayed it in, okay? It's part of his prayer here. Now, look down at verse 54. When Solomon finished praying, uh, when he finished praying this entire prayer and petitions the Lord, he got up from kneeling before the altar of the Lord. Here's the earthly king, and where's he at? He's on his knees before the king of kings. Okay? He's on his knees before the king of kings. Now, it's a prayer, it's praise, but it's a pretty good outline. For prayer starts off with what? Praise the Lord, and then you're a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. But then he's dealing with sin, okay? And what? Repentance and restoration, okay? And when he gets up, he's been on his knees while he's been doing this. He gets up. Chapter 9, though, God's going to give an answer, okay? And I find it interesting. Solomon's prayer is like, what, 50 verses? God's, prayer, God's answer is just a few verses, Okay? But God sticks with the theme He's been telling them since, <clears throat> since the days of Moses. Okay? Chapter 9. 
When Solomon finished building the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all Solomon desired to do, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, just as he appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and petition you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple you built. When did he do that? When the cloud came. Okay. To put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there at all times. Look, that temple's gone. But there's something about Israel that God's still watching out for them. Okay. And if you read the end of the book, he's still watching out for Israel and Jerusalem. Now, as for you, Solomon, if you walk before me as your father David walked, with a heart of integrity and what is and in what is right, doing everything I commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and ordinances, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised your father David, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Okay? That's as for you, king. Okay? But then he goes on here, and I think this one here, you can apply to us and every person that's ever throughout Israel's history. And anybody who calls themselves a child of God today, can I put, their, put ourselves in this one? If you or your sons turn away from following me and do not keep my commands, my statutes that I have set before you, and if you go and serve other gods and bow and worship to them, I will cut off Israel from the land I gave them. You, Solomon, and your sons. Okay? Anybody that's... This, this temple's here. This is where I'm going to dwell. This is, this is the place I've got us all pointed at right now. And Solomon, here's the deal. This is, this is my place. And But if you or any of your sons... You abandon my statutes. You abandon my commands. And if you bow down, now in our day we don't bow down to stupid little trinkets, but in their day they did. If you bow down and worship these things, okay? Now, is Solomon going to do these things? <coughs> Unfortunately. And out of all those wives that he has, and all those temples and all that stuff he's going to bring into the land, okay? The kingdom's not going to stay after him. There's going to be a split. When he dies, there's going to be a split. Okay? Northern and southern kingdoms, and they're going to take off from there. Okay? But I will cut you off from the land I gave them. I will reject the temple I have sanctified for my name. Israel will become an object of scorn and ridicule among all the peoples. Instead of them being a light that says... Look, world, who the real God of the universe is. Instead, because of what you're going to do, and I cut you off, okay, because why? You're, well, really, you're blaspheming my name, and so God's not going to put up with that. And so instead of everybody going, hey, look, the God of Israel over there, they're going to look and they're going to, what? It's not going to work out right. It's not a light. It's really a curse, okay? Everyone who passes by will be appalled and will scoff. Okay. They will say, why did the Lord do this to this land and this temple? People are going to look and they're going to go, why, why, why is it? The God who, of Israel who, I mean, gave them this land. I mean, they were so outnumbered. They should have never been. I mean, they didn't even have a real army. They should have never been able to take over. They should have never been able to do what they did. The God who gave them all this. The God who helped David get everything. The God that gave Solomon such wealth. And someday in the future, when this is messed up, the people are going to look and they're going to laugh and they're going to think, why did God do that? And then he's going to say, because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of the land of Egypt. They held on to their other gods. They bowed and worshipped to them and served them. Because of this, the Lord brought all this ruin on them. This is his children he's going to bring ruin on, right? Because they did what? They sinned against him. Okay? If you're a child of God, 
again, if you never get disciplined, you probably ought to go and check your salvation. Okay? But if you get disciplined, you know what? You're a child of God. But look, a child of God can be rebellious even in the process of God trying to get your attention. Amen. Okay? Amen. <laughs> happens a lot. Okay? And God won't put up with it forever. Okay? And eventually God will say enough's enough. Okay? So we have to be careful with these things. I think God's given this... God's, God doesn't go off to the whole blessings and curses and all that stuff again after Saul's bread. What's he simply say? He goes right back to that whole idolatry thing. That whole idea of prostituting themselves, not keeping the one true living God, and walking away from Him and basically leaving them, committing adultery against Him to do what? Run off to all these other things. And God says that's enough. Now, go to our day. Can we get into that same stuff? Because idolatry don't exactly look the same today as it did back then. But, but I would say in some ways it's worse. Because <laughs> see, then at least everybody showed up at some temple in front of some idol and they did all kinds of really bad stuff. But nobody can see everything that's in our minds, can they? Amen. Right? Or they can't see those things that we let, what, get into our mind, but can't, that we start to focus on, and they become more important. You know? And there's a lot of those things. I mean, the easy one, sports. I mean, that's an easy one. You know, they, they always said, hey, what do you call the God of the South during the fall? SEC football. You know? It's too cold to go to church, but it's not too cold to sit out there all day long at a football game. Okay? And, and, and I'm just picking on the one right now, but there are plenty of them. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have an all or nothing type personality. So it's, I mean, it's literally all or nothing. And I have to be real careful with that. So there are certain things. I mean, I took a car apart years ago. It's still sitting apart. It's been apart now 20 <laughs> years. Okay. Why? Because it's, I, I'm all or nothing. And I have to be real careful with it. Okay. Kids can be an idol. Spouse or just boyfriend, girlfriend, any of that stuff. All that can become an idol. Anything that what takes your attention and focuses it more important than God. Okay? And God won't take second place. Okay? We talked about that a little bit last week. What the the picture, the marriage picture is what? It's just a picture of our relationship with God, right? So God's given them a warning to them in their day about idolatry, but I think He's given us a warning in our day the same thing because we deal with the same type. Of, well, we deal with idolatry just in a different way, okay? and it's all over the place. Okay? We're supposed to enjoy the things that God gives us, but we have to be careful because there is a what? There's a fine line there, okay? a real fine line. Heck, work can get that way. Okay? Yeah, all kinds of stuff can get us into that thing. I mean, <laughs> people. Some people can be addicted to all kinds of things. You don't just have to be drugs and alcohol. Right. <coughs> Dare I say, can be drama. <laughs> can be TV. There's all kinds of stuff. Okay? There's all kinds of stuff that we can get caught up in. All right. But God's saying, don't do any of that. Okay? Why? Where is the temple of God now? Because, see, that thing doesn't exist anymore. Well, if you're a child of His, we're the temple of God, right? Okay. Now, you don't pray to yourself, but the God who, who inhabits the temple, what? Here's what we pray, right? We don't have to turn and face to, I don't know which way Israel is. We don't have to turn and face Israel. Why? Because that's not where the temple of God is. He's dwelling with us. The other thing is, is remember how they handled everything? No, we didn't read all that stuff. But they even weren't to keep from hammering in the future temple while it was being built. All that was done outside. So they wouldn't even have, there was such detail 
and still reverence on handling the temple? Hey, how you doing with yours? <laughs> Amen. What do you do with some of the stuff that might be damaged in the temple? I know I get on that all the time, right? People think I'm just me, but I'm right. It's the temple of God. Anyway, it, it, there's a lot of things that can go with that. All right, I, I'll leave it. Too many cokes. I get it. There's all kinds of stuff you can have to get in. We'll just throw anything out there, all right? There's all kinds of stuff. Hey, how you doing? You, look, you could drive too fast and put your temple of God in, into trouble, can't you? I mean, there's a lot of places, all right? So it's not just one. But the temple of God, how you dealing with it? And then last thing, Proverbs 21. This happens to be in this week's reading. And I was just going to look a couple. Because, hey, when you're looking at uh, God sitting here saying these things about idolatry and all that, well, Solomon was the wisest man. And what does he do? He puts together the Proverbs. So I just kind of highlighted just a few out of this little chapter 21. Verse 1, the king's heart is like channel water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. That's the king. That, that could also be the president. But guess what? It doesn't have to be. It could be what? Anybody in any kind of authority or leadership position. Anybody that thinks they got it all figured out, God can just kind of change his mind. All, verse 2, all a, per, all a person's ways seem right to him. But the Lord weighs the heart. Y'all ever argued with yourself or with anybody else that, that in their mind it's they got it all figured out. They got the plan. They got it. Look, they have done all the mental gymnastics to make it right, right? And and if they're talking to you or if it's you talking to yourself, you've got it all laid out with all the reasons. Okay? And you never really give the bad reasons. You always make it look like. Well, this is for God, and this has got to be holy, and I'm doing this for the Lord. It, it, you never, but see, God knows the intentions. <laughs> All the person's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Okay? And then, Mark verse 6, Making a fortune through a lying tongue is a vanishing mist in the pursuit of death. This is the same guy who God spoke to and said, don't get involved in all this. And here's the stuff he's writing. Look at verse 7. The violence of the wicked sweeps them away because they refuse to act justly. Somebody who, they're, they're not, they don't care anything about justice. Okay? Usually they end up where? In violence. Okay? But those who deal with violence get swept away with violence. Eight, a guilty one's conduct is crooked, but the behavior of the innocent is upright. <laughs> Y'all dealt with those people right here when they're guilty. What do they do? They, they'll argue up, down. They'll, they'll, they'll keep on you. They'll, they've got, they got every excuse and every reason. And usually you can tell they're guilty because they just keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on with it, right? But the behavior of the innocent suffer. Somebody that's innocent, they don't go around trying to figure out how to manipulate everything. Okay? I can't not do this one. Better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. <laughs> Might as well just go ahead and get myself in trouble while I'm here. Let's, uh, well, if we're going to do that one, let's hit 19 too. Better to live in a wilderness than a nagging, hot-tempered wife. <laughs> I just had to throw that one in there. On the flip side, I guess I better go back and say that uh, verse 5, the plans of the diligent certainly lead to profit, but anyone who is reckless certainly becomes poor. Uh, a wife that has to deal with the reckless husband that spends all the money got just as much problems as the other side of that. Okay. Verse 10, a wicked person desires evil. He has no consideration for his neighbor. Solomon actually talked about that, right? About the neighbor. Hey. 
A wicked person, they don't care. All they care about is what? The evil that they're doing, what they're wanting to do. Verse 11, when a mocker is punished, the inexperienced become wiser. <laughs> a mocker. A mocker is somebody you just can't get through to. That it, You can't reason with that person. They got it all figured out. They're going to argue with you on everything. You can't reason with that kind of person to get any kind of change. So what ends up being the case? They end up just being punished. When that person gets punished, the inexperienced, that one who just doesn't know yet, becomes wise. Okay. I don't name names, but we've, we've had some people. I, I know a person right now. The two younger siblings have seen what the older sibling has done, and they want no part of all that lifestyle. Okay. But that one there, the one that's got it, big time mocker, thought he was funny, and where's he at? He's in prison now. And the other siblings are going, I want no part of it. Okay. The one who teaches a wise man, he acquires knowledge. Somebody that's teachable, man, they can, they can go far, unlike the mocker. The, right, the righteous one considers the house of the wicked. He brings the wicked to ruin. The righteous one. Who's the righteous one? God. You and I can't be that judge. Okay? God is the judge. He's the one that brings the wicked to ruin. It's not our job to go out there and figure out who the wicked people are so we can punish them. It's not our job. Okay. Whose job is it? It's God's. Okay. That's His. And then the last one I've got marked here. Just at verse 15. Justice executed is a joy to the righteous, but a terror to those who practice iniquity. Okay. Justice. God's a God of justice. Okay. And those who don't, who hate justice, well, they live in terror of that. Okay. So I just picked a few of these things because here, here Solomon is. He's, he's dedicating the temple. His prayer you know, is about when God's people do these things. Okay. Well, they did all those things. Okay. But now the temple living here okay, doesn't change anything except we're on this side of the cross. Okay. God still says what? Don't do those things. How do we know how not to what not to do? You gotta read the book. You gotta read the book. And what does he say about the Old Testament? He gave us this for our knowledge and learning. Okay? So God says, don't get caught up in the idolatry. In their case, the idolatry that this world puts up in front of us all the time. And to stay connected. To God. Okay? And when we do get caught up in stuff, what do we do? We pray, we repent, and guess what we get? 